Hello and welcome everybody to the latest Temple Bar Trust online talk. I'm Lucy Bolivant and I've curated the Trust online series of talks which kicked off uh, back in July. And I be, will be moderating today's session. And so I am especially delighted to welcome our speaker, architect David Ogunmuyiwa, founder of his practice, Architecture Doing Place. Hello, David. Good to see you. Morning, Lucy, and thank you for inviting me to join your lecture series. It's a real pleasure. So now a quick word firstly on the Temple Bar Trust. Now, Sir Christopher Wren's Temple Bar building in Paternoster Square, which many of you may well have walked past or know very well, a real architectural gateway to the city. It is home to the Worshipful Company of Chartered Architects, of which I am a livery man. Yes, indeed. And Temple Bar is managed by the Temple Bar Trust, which takes as its aim the promotion of architecture in the square mile to a wide public through a regular program of talks and tours. And a key focus of its work has always been supporting greater diversity in the architectural profession, a subject of profound and pressing significance we are addressing as part of our ongoing online talk series. Now, presenting talks online is an interim measure until we can actually use Temple, the Temple Bar building again as a unique space for meetings, dinings, dining and entertainment, hopefully very soon in 2021. So do check the Trust's website, templebartrust.org, for announcements on that front and for all future events which are regularly added there and are all free of charge, they just require a reservation in advance. So now to introduce David Ogunmuyiwa. David is an, architecture, uh, an architect and the founder of Architecture Doing Place, his London-based practice, and he is a mayor's design advocate. He trained as an architect at South Bank University, London Met, and the Bartlett School of Architecture, and he's trained in construction management additionally. He currently combines practice work with teaching at Portsmouth University. Before setting up Architecture Doing Place, he worked with Burry Foley Fisher, DSDHA and Karakusevich Carson Architects, and he did a three-year architectural work stint in the Middle East. Now, uniquely among, amongst all 39,000 UK arch registered architects, David worked as a housing officer for social landlords, including Lambeth, Southwark, Tar Hamlets and Circle 33. We're really looking forward to your talk today, David. Uh, David is going to explore the ornamental narrative, expressions of diaspora heritage through decoration in placemaking, a theme at the heart of his practice. Now, this top ally topic aligns closely with our strong motivation at the Trust to in investigate issues of identity and meaning in contemporary architecture and to place a focus on practitioners' active engagement of diverse communities, narratives and languages in London, representing, uh, as they do, resilient and equitable cultural drivers of placemaking in the city in the 21st century as it transitions through the COVID crisis into a new era. So after David's talk, we'll have a, um, a short discussion between myself and David. I've got a couple of questions to, to put to him, and then we'll have a Q&A discussion with you, our audience. So please do put your questions to David in the chat box. So thank you very much, David, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Um, so on the, on the one hand, um, my talk this morning is about aesthetics, um, my attitude towards ornaments, uh, decoration, uh, artifice and, and so forth. But on the other hand, it's also about uh, my biography and my identity. Uh, this is why I've described it as an ornamented narrative, because I think it's um, it is about a kind of a personal journey, but it's been um, enriched by influences from other places. I hope I can expand on this during uh, this talk and the conversation that follows. So mobile populations inevitably bring influences of home to placemaking. Should our cities resist this, given how uh, cities established diverse communities contribute to the procuring of the built environment through taxes? Where are the expressions of those heritages uh, that come from other places and at what scale? 
Could these go on to inform a new creative vitality accessible to everyone, but unique to its context, as happens in music, fashion and film? Architecture is currently far behind on this. Architecture doing place have been exploring expressions and accents of diaspora heritage through motif, emblem, decoration, artifice, ornament in the city and placemaking. We're fascinated by their potential to extend all citizens' spatial narratives and so reflect the myriad private realms, psychologies, concerns and aspirations. I hope to highlight these through some of our projects. Uh, we believe that these meanings can mutate and transform our visual vernacular. What would London look like if there was more authorship from a broader range of its inhabitants with different allusions, reference points and readings alongside the established sensibilities? I've, I've enjoyed the flowering of these examples over the last few years. So I'm just going to flick through some of my slides. On my background first, the, the reason I wanted to show you um, uh, this first slide, which is of Angel Town um, Estates in Brixton, was uh, and uh, great credit to, to uh, Borough Foley Fisher because it talks to both these issues about kind of context and place making, but also um, uh, my identity. And um, by my identity in this context, I'm talking about my access into architecture. So my identity as an architect, um, and it informed that. So I, um, Angel Town Estate is next door to the Loughborough Estate, and I was a housing officer on, on the Loughborough Estate studying um, part-time um, uh, on the part one course to, uh, at South Bank University. Um, and I noticed that they were knocking down the, the neighbouring estate and I went to ask uh, if I could be involved um, during my lunch break. And they said, go and talk to um, the five practices. Um, I spoke to uh, somebody on the estate called Dora Brotimer, who was the chair of the Angel Town Community Project at the time. Um, Dora Brotimer, MBE, she actually sadly passed away during the process. Uh, and she said, go and speak to the five teams that were um, regenerating the estate. And that's how I got into practice. Now, that um, process has allowed me to see the world from a couple of um, angles. It's allowed me to see it as uh, somebody who was trying to get into architecture and then also allowed me to see it um, whilst being immersed in architecture from a practitioner's point of view. And I remember very starkly going overnight from telling people what they couldn't have um, on behalf of the council because, you know, the council has various limitations on, on budgets and things it can and can't do to asking them what they wanted as an architect and that was immensely powerful almost overnight uh, so that kind of felt like an immensely powerful um thing uh so the, the the opportunity that that gave me was then to start to try and put some of myself into that because what i found was that the world of world of architecture was very even then it was very monocultural now this was um 21 years ago in in 1999 however it wasn't um, uh, it, London was already then a an established kind of diverse city, well known throughout the world as being uh, an established diverse city. But there wasn't very much um, evidence of that within the profession. Now, the ornamented narrative that I'm beginning to um, see examples of and enjoy and notice um, include um, projects like 15 Clark and Well um, Close um, by Amin Taha and this picture by um, Tim Saw. Um, articulates it um, really well in that it allows us to kind of use both of our illusions, our illusions of um, heritages that, that may have just been reported to us through our parents and through our, our families uh, and the ones we grew up around. So here's a Hawksmoor church in the background of uh, a uh, kind of bleeding edge um, architectural intervention by um, Amin Taha. I mean, so controversial that it became a kind of um, contentious um, planning issue. Uh, here is a, a project um, by uh, Yinke Lori, a, a um, friend and, and uh, designer and practitioner, uh, spatial practitioner uh, in the grounds of um, the Dulwich Picture Gallery, so the Dulwich um, Pavilion of last year, that again, draws on, um, there is, it's called the Colour Palace, and it draws on allusions to other places. By the way, I should also credit Price Score, who were the architects who supported uh, Yinka on that, who um, collaborated with, I should say, Yinka on that. Um, and it has allusions to the kind of fabrics and energies and the aesthetics of a different place uh, transported into the context of uh, London and the UK. Uh, here's another project by Camille Walala and, and Leighton. Uh, and again, this is uh, 
about a kind of, it's about another place transposed. Well, one of the things that I find really intriguing about each of these projects, and I, um, each of these projects I've gone through, I'll just flick through them really quickly, is that while they, they all seem thrillingly new, none of them actually seem that out of place to my eyes, at least. They, what, they, what they do is recall other places, but they also talk about the vibrancy and energy of London and about the here and the now and the, an attitude to um, creativity and aesthetics that we have now. We talk about in our practice quite often, and, and we, we kind of, you may have heard it because we, we share it widely as well, that we talk about how our shared built environment forms all of us inescapably and how its authorship should be seen as a form of franchise. The city makes us, so we feel that we should make the city as well. Um, and I don't think that that's necessarily a controversial thing to say. And we, what we try and do in our practice and in our <coughs> approach is to get architecture to catch up with that sentiment. Um, and that is central to our approach. Uh, here's a picture. So on the um, right hand side, uh, this is a picture of the multiple awards um, that Beryl Foley Fisher won for Angel Town. Um, I went through the whole, it was my first project in practice, it was a steep learning curve, I went through the whole four years of it. It won two housing design awards, an RBA award, uh, Building for Life Gold Standards, it was a Cape Enabler project. People came from all over the world regularly for many years after it was constructed to come and visit it from China, from Brazil, from the United States, from France, um, to come and visit it. Because it, not only did it speak about how you could do community engagement well and work in communities well and work with people who were there and that reflected that environment, but also it reflected how you could, uh, an approach of understanding that um, you needed to start with the end user as the focus of um, developing these these designs. I put a kind of almost a provocative, but it, it always makes me smile, image uh, of, of some graffiti um, on um, the uh, left-hand side, uh, because what it, what that talks to me about is how um, our approach is marked to an, an attention to um, to end users and communities, and re recognizing, reflecting, and re revealing, and connecting with the immense productive capacity that in, exists in these contexts. These are often um, people in this context are often seen as takers and not makers, despite um, creatives in fashion, uh, music, and other industries. Uh, there is immense productive capacity, ingenuity and industry there. I grew up on the Ellsbury estate in, in South London. I <coughs> it's not far from there even now. But I know for a fact that there is immense productive capacity in there. Um, and that has informed the way that we set up our practice um, and uh, con configure our practice and the way we work with end users as we go through. And we work across a range of sectors that we um, try and specialize in, including um, uh, housing, the arts, uh, and placemaking and public realm. So um, we'd love to do more arts projects, but um, at, at the moment, we, uh, the arts projects we tend to do um, tend to be uh, installations. We'd, we'd really love to do something more permanent. Um, uh, this is a uh, uh, an installation that we did uh, that we created um, in uh, the uh, Tate Britain. It was part of the Tate Britain Families Festival in 2015, uh, and we were required to create an overall um, strategy for um, lots of artists who were inhabiting various rooms through the Duveen galleries, um, uh, but also to create a play fort for this lady, um, performance artist, Lady Vondredi, who um, needed to, a uh, uh, play fort to interact with kids and uh, young people in, uh, and it needed to be demountable and that it would travel around the country. We um, conceived of something uh, made out of cardboard uh, because it would be cheap and cheerful. We felt that we could make um, frame out of um, cardboard, um, uh, that would be able to be demountable um, and that could um, be remountable at, uh, at different locations that would be cheap to move around and cheap to make. Um, and we just really enjoyed the kind of the energy of this and the irreverence actually of it. Um, what, what part of our uh, approach, which I actually did, should have mentioned, is that we, we try and always be playful, we try and be thoughtful um, and articulate what to us is often quite intuitive, but we try and focus on uh, and articulating that. So forgive me if, if sometimes I sound a bit um, pretentious in, in what I'm saying. It's, it's really me trying to kind of grapple with what we do instinctively um, quite often. Um, 
in public realm projects, um, public realm projects like Thessaly Road underpass, which um, we were shortlisted for um, as part of a London Festival of Architecture con competition. This was actually won by uh, Yinko Lorry um, uh, a couple of years ago as well. Um, we um, were really struck by the um, context in, in which this was set. So this is in, in Wandsworth in Nine Elms, um, and it's in the midst of a really kind of um, established um, uh, uh, low-income community with at least two housing estates around it. Um, the fence you can see to the right-hand side um, is uh, a uh, to the left hand side, excuse me, is um, uh, St George's School there, where uh, and talking about this immense productive capacity. So Willard White, the opera singer, went there when he was a child. Uh, Roger Daltrey went to that same school when he was a child. So this is just kind of testament to the, this this um, point that we make about often what you need to do is um, create access for people in these communities because if you do that, they reward you with um, an end product. In, in which you get a lot of creativity and benefit of it. You can see a Battersea Power Station, the turrets at Battersea Power Station, uh, Gilbert Scott's Battersea Power Station in the background. Um, you can see the cranes of all the development that's going up uh, uh, around that. On the left, on the right hand side, um, this kind of yellow wall and everything back from that is a Covent Garden flower market. So you've got these kind of quite this quite iconic area of London. This is very emblematic of London in, in a way, and how all these things have jammed together, cheap by jowl. Um, and ev everybody has access to the to kind of a, a knowledge and a, and a kind of a sense of these places, but everybody's take on those is different. Um, uh, intriguingly, amongst that kind of um, th those creepers that are going up that um, railway um, uh, viaduct pier is a national front um, bit of graffiti that's probably been there for for forty years. So that again talks about the context in in which these these kind of the social context and and the content contentions that um, we often um, work in as well. Um, uh, we were really struck about this kind of whilst this this was a grimy, um, dilapidated, decrepit. Um, uh, area an underpass and not very uh, welcoming and probably quite threatening late at night it was also somewhere where kids who go to that school um, pass through every morning and it's just part of their route to school it's actually really familiar and well loved by them and we wanted to have a conversation um, with them about the things that they loved about it in the community when we went to the community and we, and we had conversations with them one of the first things conversations we had about them um, we, we thought we'd approach it in terms of we'd, we splash color everywhere uh, and and um, uh, and kind of make it really bright and vibrant, vibrant, and bright and um, vibrant, which we don't have a problem with. We we which we may have gone down that line, but actually, one of the things that they um, one person said was that they actually wanted to be respected and dignified, and they didn't mind the um, new economic development that was going on around them, but they wanted to be acknowledged by it. They wanted to be seen and they wanted to be respected by it. And they also had kind of aspirations of some element of finesse and kind of um, elegance and uh, uh, kind of uh, these these um, an empathy and, and kind of the nicer things that I, I think everybody aspires to. So we started to kind of boil this down into a palette of kind of the sorts of elements that we wanted to express in our design. Um, so we, we started to look at things about pattern, things that would, would express elements of opulence, um, but also uh, things that uh, would respect uh, reflect um, some form of acknowledgement of different people's heritages there. And then we worked with um, fine artist uh, Mary Evans, who is now um, one of the course leaders at Chelsea School of Fine Art. Um, she, um, she makes these wonderful um, paper cutout um, uh, wall um, hangings um, uh, that she uh, uh, exhibits in galleries all over the world um, and uh, they're often uh, of women interacting with children of uh, uh, people being transported from one place to another uh, uh, refugees trying to cross oceans those sorts of quite uh, these these beautiful silhouettes that are really quite kind of dense with narrative as well and we wanted to to have uh, uh, aspects of those in our work but we also um, part of our work is also um, focusing on um, urban design and urban consequences of what we do so we, we wanted to um, talk about how we could use our intervention to um, make the place um, a happier place, but also allow it to kind of knit it back into the city. 
And I absolutely coincidentally, I remember my mum when I was a kid had a really good friend that lived in that area. So I remember kind of going down there with her. We'd drive down there on a the weekend and, and spend um, the time with, with her kids. And I'd go and play football with, with her son. But I couldn't really um, find where I was because even though I was in the, in the midst of, I'll just go back to that picture at Battersea Pass Station. I was in the middle of London and some quite iconic um, landmarks of London, it's really difficult to navigate your way around there and to find out, um, to get from A to B. If you're a child, you, you probably, unless you're standing quite far back, you probably wouldn't see those turrets. So if you're visiting there as a child, how do you know um, where the river is, for instance, um, from where we are? So we wanted to create these landmarks. Another kind of useful bit of serendipity is that, that the, the railway viaduct that's above it, um, I teach at Portsmouth University, so I would take a train um, one day a week, um, every Tuesday, uh, and I would go past that site and I didn't really notice it because if anybody's ever been on that line out of um, London, out of um, London Waterloo down to Hampshire, um, those kind of, that, that hinterland uh, uh, um, uh, beside the railways is kind of anonymous. It's there and you vaguely know where it is and you're trying to recognise where everything is, but it's really anonymous to try and find, figure out um, uh, what's there and where you are at any one time. So we wanted to do a couple of things. We wanted to connect um, everybody. Um, we wanted to connect everybody who was walking through that railway with the rest of London and, and the new development and the rest of the, the world uh, effectively. But we also wanted to connect people on the trains that were going past uh, with everybody in that community. We wanted, it, we thought of it as an act of revealing. We wanted to reveal the people that were there to the newcomers, but to also people that are going past. So we um, envisaged a couple of um, opt massive optical inf uh, instruments. So this one is a huge periscope that is um, actually orientated towards the river and towards Battersea um, uh, and towards the river. Um, but the one on the other side, I'll just flick back to that, is actually a huge camera, camera obscura that's set in the grounds of the school. And what it allowed um, people to do was to take views in a couple of directions. There was also a kind of kaleidoscope at, at child's eye level within, within that, so the kids could interact with this thing in a kind of playful way. But we loved the idea of somebody sitting on the plane, uh, on the train, and a camera um, obscura capturing a kind of elegiac image of them as they went, by, uh, as they went past. And we, we really kind of enjoyed the, the playful element of that. And that was a way for us to kind of connect all these aspects, the people on the train, the people in the context and, and the newcomers to it and the, and the people there back into the city, back into the prosperity of the city and connect them um, back outwards. Um, another project that we've done, this is one we've done um, really, really recently in the last um, couple of weeks, we got shortlisted. We were very grateful to be shortlisted by Argent for a project on their new Brent Cross development um, at Staples Corner, um, where the M1 um, comes into London. Um, and uh, what they wanted was a marker that sat on top of um, a new um, substation, a new power station, uh, a, a new energy centre um, at this um, kind of unloved um, point. Um, but it also actually was going to be then become kind of um, something that marked your entrance into London. So what we wanted was something, um, what we spoke about uh, with, with the client was something that would be on the scale of um, the Angel of the North and something that would have that presence. Now it had a slightly different purpose because it needed to have messaging at high level um, for people coming on the motorway, but also needed to have people uh, messaging at low level for people at um, Staples Corner. Uh, and then it also needed to sit on top of a, a uh, energy substation. And it also needed to um, shield um, that substation from the um, railway and from other activities that are going on around it. So we proposed um, this kind of, we called it a, bin a binnacle, uh, this kind of totemic um, uh, object in, in the landscape. Uh, and we, we wanted it to be pretty huge. We were still kind of playing around with the size. Um, if we'd have won the um, competition, to be honest, we probably would have shrunk it quite considerably, but we wanted to kind of have this bold presentation. Um, and just to kind of expand these things. So there's kind of um, leaf-shaped motifs because we started to work um, um, relatively recently with, with the idea of really kind of going to town with these emblems and, uh, and kind of not necessarily um, uh, uh, um, shine away from them. Because I think what, what we discovered, what we've learned from probably peers um, out there is that there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of 
energy in being quite upfront about what we're trying to do. So if, if, if we made references back to kind of African fabrics or Indian fabrics and motif and pattern and cells, um, we found that that's a thing that is both um, specific and ambiguous at the same time. And one of the things we found, and I'll talk about this in a later project, is that we found that decoration um, isn't just a thing that um, belongs to a heritage when we talk about ethnicity, but actually everybody is quite, um, uh, everybody has a relationship to uh, um, uh, decoration and emblem, even if it's that they don't like it, even if it's a complete minimalist and they, they, they hate it, but everybody's got an attitude to it and a relationship to it. From a Fort, Fortnum and Mason's um, tin, uh, tea tin to a, um, uh, uh, a caravan uh, that, that's highly decorated. Um, so th this is the, these are some images of the um, totem that we um, uh, proposed. Uh, and we um, uh, proposed that this would be made out of a kind of composite, um, very thin veneers of um, real stone that would be laid on uh, a honeycomb um, uh, backing. So it's a kind of um, rain screen um, cladding system that goes up and then, and then vast um, digital um, screens that would show um, audio visual uh, movies, uh, are curated art uh, programs um, and information like timing, uh, time, the weather, information about um, Brent Cross uh, messaging um, at lower level and at higher level um, from um, Staples Corner, from the motorway, um, from the railway that goes from um, Hertfordshire into King's Cross. Uh, and then we started to work again, we, we started to supercharge that and, 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 and kind of work with different mm -hmm. patterns and think about what that might do. So if we started to kind of use those accents, and I always say most architects, certainly not all architects, but lots of architects aren't great with color. I, I often feel that you can tell what architects do with color, but perhaps I'm projecting my own anxieties onto, onto other people with that. But what we try and do with that is that we feel like we can use material better than we can use color. So when we when we talk about pattern, we try and think about how we can use colorful materials and um, align them together and juxtapose those together in different formations to make a kind of pattern that would represent a kind of vibrancy and, uh, and a color. Um, and, you know, here's another kind of um, variety of those that we use and another option, but we're really kind of keen to do something very, very striking and memorable as you as you um, came into uh, came into London. That's probably going to be kind of announced in the press in, in, in a couple of days. And, and I've been told I can use that. So I'm very grateful to Argent for allowing me to use that in this talk. Um, another strand of our work is uh, community projects. Um, and um, we were really lucky to be invited um, for a charrette in um, uh, for a, an annual pavilion that happened uh, uh, behind Portobello Market. Um, if anybody knows the top, the Tabernacle Art Centre in Notting Hill, um, in front of that is the is Power Square, which is a really historic but also a really famous um, um, square. Um, so Power Square, um, the, the the buildings around that um, were. In fact, I'll, I'll move on to this really quickly. The buildings around. Uh, the, the pavilion are the buildings that you would see um, that were in the film performance with, um, um, I can't remember which which um, Fox it is, I think it's Edward Fox um, uh, and Mick Jagger, um, the the, the um, iconic uh, 1960s movie, uh, or is it 1970s, I can never quite remember, um, uh, of uh, uh, kind of 60s psych psychedelia. Um, uh, but it's also um, really, really famous um, for Charles Van Hoogstraten, I think his name was, uh, the slum landlord. So it's this, this, this is a site of um, both historic kind of um, iconography for London, the UK swing in London, a kind of um, vibrancy of London, but also this um, contentious kind of accommodation of how people live and how um, how people on lower incomes are accommodated within London. So that, um, now all these, uh, the housing that you see in the, this image are kind of um, multi-million pound townhouses. Um, the, the, um, is, there is an estate on the left hand, uh, right, uh, sorry, left hand side uh, of the image um, hidden behind those trees that is a um, local authority housing estate. And we wanted to create um, a, a clearing in, um, in the space that was a kind of clearing of ownership where everybody could um, have a space to kind of come together 
uh, and create art and have conversations. And there was some screenings for the Portovello Film Festival. There were uh, what we we curated a program of, uh, that we called the Bright School. Um, just down there, if you step off um, this side and you step on the pavement in front of the tabernacle, you can see Grenfell Tower in the distance over uh, above um, uh, Portobello Market. You can see you can see obviously Portobello Market there. So again, it's in the it's kind of in the centre of kind of iconic, um, vibrant in a in a London. Um, uh, we were really um, lucky um, and grateful um, to have won the, the charrette against some fabulous um, uh, emerging practices in London, like practice architecture, OMMX, uh, the decorators, um, uh, Westport and company. Um, and one of the things we try to do, because we, we always try and kind of expand as far as possible some form of social impact from whatever we do. So. Uh, uh, behind me, I'm kind of expounding in the picture on the left hand side, you, you might see um, um, three students who we brought along and made part of our team for the charrette. Um, and um, hopefully that kind of contributed um, to some of our ideas. Um, but then also what, what we tried to do, I, I'll just tell you a little bit about the program before I go into social value impact again. Um, but um, it was a massive, it was a really cheap and cheerful project. So it's very, very quick and very, very cheap. So we had from that charrette to, from the, the first ideas in the room on that charrette to the um, having it mounted on site, being fabricated and put up on site, we had about nine weeks. So we had to develop this thing, we had to fabricate it, uh, we were the material we used was the, um, was actually medium um, density fiberboard, which we from you know we're trying to be more eco friendly. We probably wouldn't have used that material, but we were very very grateful for the to, to the supplier who um, um, sponsored the process and um, delivered that material for free. The entire process, including our fees, was nineteen point five. Uh, sorry, nineteen and a half thousand pounds. Um, uh, and unfortunately, we didn't actually pay, get paid that until the Thursday before it opened. So I had to, um, we, we actually had to kind of subsidize this on our practice credit cards um, and, uh, up to that point, which was really, really difficult. So we, we basically, we had to design this, make sure that it was a kind of modularized design, fabricate it, get it engineered get it installed on site all in the space of nine weeks. And we didn't have access to the site because Power Square is also part of the Notting Hill Carnival. So we only had access to the site a week before we could install it. So we had we, we had to, we didn't have a, an empty cleared site um, until after that. And then it was up for um, 10 days and then we had to demount it and clear the site and and um, hand it over, uh, make everything good and hand it over as a, as a um, in its pristine form within the space of 12 weeks. So that was quite a challenge, as you can imagine, quite a stressful challenge, but it was, it was great fun. Um, but also what that allowed us to do um, was to work with um, uh, local um, uh, people that had um, skills. So we worked with people who had um, kind of handyman skills and um, um, who could put things together and who could drill things. Obviously, uh, uh, we tried to pay them. Uh, we, well, we did pay them. We paid them a stipend for that out of our uh, uh, minuscule budget. Um, we made sure, so you can see everything had to float off the deck that was there so that we could um, uh, uh, take it away afterwards. Um, it had to just be really lightweight, really cheap and cheerful. Um, we tried to apply some kind of pattern and vibrancy with these kind of geometric geometric um, kind of um, uh, patterns in, in, in bright colors. Um, take that. And also one of the things that we, we tried to do as part of it in the end was um, try and begin to, it was our first foray into thinking about the circular economy and about how to um, use less waste. And this was actually out of massive guilt from using medium density fiber boards, if, if I'm honest. But then it became a thing that we thought, actually we should be doing this on everything that we do. We should be trying to, to minimize waste and try uh, and reuse things wherever we possibly can. Um, and it's, that's really interesting. If we, if you think about that um, um, kind of 15 Clark and Well cl uh, close project by Amin Taha, um, there's a, there's obviously a kind of um, there's something in that imagery that makes me think about reusing kind of 
demolished um, uh, sites around London. We are very lucky to be working on, on the regeneration of Broadwater Farm Estate at the moment, um, uh, the uh, infamous Broadwater Farm Estate. Um, and there's going to be some demolition there because it's kind of made out. Uh, uh, there, there's one of the projects on the site is a Ronan Point um, style um, point block. Um, and um, obviously, infamously, um, that has um, uh, uh, concrete panels um, we're, uh, and, and lots of problems with that. But um, our circular economy idea was this: uh, with this, was to give away these kind of prefabricated elements to go and have a, a second life as um, part of um, Walthamstow Winter Wonderland as an ice rink. So we're really, really kind of pleased and cheered to to have that opportunity, um, and that was taken off our hands by Zap Architects, who um, uh, went off and did that with it. Um, uh, yeah, so just kind of the the, the, the extreme economy that, w that we brought from that and the, the way we were able to interact with kids and, and use the, the vibrancy uh, of that. Another um, uh, community project that we're working on at the moment that we're really fascinated by, um, because one of the things we, we try and, and talk about, often we're in spaces where we're talking about diversity and ethnicity. And one of the things we have to reassure people about first is that we're not talking about replacing one group's privileges with another group's privileges. What we're talking about is allowing um, everybody who lives in London to contribute um, to their own built environment. Um, so this project in, in Bow allowed us to work with a community that we knew nothing about, um, really, and we were coming to for the first time, which is the an Irish traveller population. So it's actually their existing site in Old Willows Close in Bow is between three, uh, it's in this kind of weird triangle of three rail railway viaducts uh, of the dis district line, I think, network rail, and then um, I believe it's a DLR viaduct there as well. Um, and uh, there is a um, crossrail um, ventilation shaft that is popping up next to that as well. And there's a bit of land left over, just a thin sliver of land that's left over. And uh, the local council asked us if we would do, um, a local council, actually Tower Hamlets Council, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call them by their name because they've, they've been very supportive. And from um, uh, David Ajay's um, idea store onwards, um, they have always been supportive for, for 20 years and they've always been diverse in the architects that they procure without having to um, be asked and without actually making much funfare about it. They just routinely um, make sure that the people who design their environments are diverse. Um, and, and I think that's, uh, you know, more of that um, should be uh, the case. Um, and um, just but, but working with this community, we, we then extended that conversation. So we started to have further conversations about this kind of these decorative accents and we're, we're, we're able at the moment we're just we're, we're still having conversations with them we're in consultation with them so the stuff I'm I'm showing you is really about consultation it's not the kind of the, the final thing um, uh, is, is to provoke um, conversations but our consultations with them are, are on the basis of trying to find out more about them through conversations actually about decoration and, and heritage and what that means to them, rather than having the usual conversations with traveler communities, which are obviously often about their kind of um, fraught and tense relationships with other communities around them and how, um, and people's suspicion and skepticism about them and their place. Um, some of the, the um, uh, we're, we're trying to provide a couple of new pitches and reconfiguring um, their their existing pitches and a commu new community centre uh, with them at the moment, uh, which we're working on. So the uh, new uh, in the top kind of that 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 um, curved barrel vaulted triple barrel vaulted object is a cross rail ventilation um, uh, um, enclosure, uh, and then we're. Um, providing an, another um, pitch in the corner and the um, um, uh, community centre in the community centre and play space actually in the um, on the edge of the estate in the little sliver of um, a green there um, and actually that play space came out of con consultation with us because we started um, by thinking it just needed to be a community centre but our conversations with the community actually um, it, it emerged that the kids at the moment, and that, you can see it in that initial image, the kids actually, at the moment actually end up playing on that roadway. And obviously there are cars and traffic there. It's a highly trafficked area because there are the vans and cars and, and caravans moving in and out of there all of the time. So what we're trying to do is create a, a space where they can um, play in the corner. So that's quite, a, you know, effectively, that's quite 
um, conventional thing that most architects would do in that in that conversation. But we really enjoyed the way that we'd approach those conversations. Now, most of our work, because of my um, unique background, and and I say it's a unique background, not because I, I kind of um, uh, preconceived it, but um, because I accidentally, it, it was a route I went through. I always wanted to be an architect from the age of 10, but um, I, I suppose at the age of 18, when I was applying to universities, I probably wasn't the most conscientious 18 year old, um, but I still always wanted to be an architect. So that's why I went off and did construction management. And then I retrained as an architect um uh following that so i did construction management then i went into housing then i retrained as an architect and what that has always offered me is a kind of set of um three different views so i understand things from the the, the competing priorities of constructors and contractors um from social housing managers and uh, and the, the kind of pressures and constraints that they have but also from the, um, from a, an architect's point of view, actually I'm going to say four because as an end user as well, because I grew up in social housing, so I understand a lot of kind of what people um, have to deal with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So kind of th this this is a very unique intersection um, that I end up with and it gives me a, a specific kind of point of view that I try and contribute to um, lots of kind of strategic advisory roles, including the mayor's design advocate um, uh, and as a um, historic um, expert advisory uh, uh, a member of the Historic um, England Expert Advisory Panel um, of various design review panels uh, across the UK, uh, across the South East, I should really say. Um, the first project that we did um, in social housing was um, Brick Lane Infield. This was again for um, uh, Tower Hamlets Council or Tower Hamlets Homes. Um, and it, it's a very, it's a relatively prominent site because it's, it's slap bang in the middle. Uh, it's at the end of Brick Lane uh, where you're almost at Columbia Road Market. And what we found really interesting about this, this site in urban design terms is that um, it, these kind of markets that rely on kind of peripatetic um, flows of traffic, people wandering through um, from one market to the other, it's the kind of lifeblood of these markets. Um, and they need, they need kind of signals um, to get people from one place to the other. Um, lots of people um, know how to get to those because they're Londoners. They go there on, you know, lots of people will go to Columbia Road Market and then they might walk down to Brick Lane or they might just stay at Columbia Road Market and go home or they might be at Brick Lane and they might um, walk down to Columbia Road Market or vice versa. But lots of tourists use these markets and the economy of those places actually relies on those tourists and it's not so easy for them to find their way to, to those places. What that actually means is in this area of dense social housing, there is a lack of privacy for the people who live in those contexts because there are lots and lots of people who are constantly wandering through around there. And actually what that often brings is a lot of crime because nobody really knows who belongs where. So what we tried to do is create a, an object in the, in the cityscape, in the streetscape, that would become a kind of beacon and that would kind of formalise, that would, that would allow a kind of um, preferred route to emerge. And that preferred route would then mean that it would create a kind of more privacy and kind of a quieter environment in the streets around it so that everybody wasn't milling through there. So there would be this landmark that people would follow and it would just be this kind of quiet, passive, um, almost unspoken way of getting from um, Brick Lane to Columbia Market or uh, vice versa and this kind of lamp, this, this recognisable um, funny shaped thing in the landscape um, that uh, people could reference. And so if you're giving your friends um, directions, you're just going to go a bit left and then you'll see the funny shaped thing with these diamond shaped um, timber um, uh, rain screen on it. They probably wouldn't use that language like architects would, but you, you get the sense of what I'm saying. Um, and, they, uh, and they would find their way from A to B. Um, and again, another interesting thing with us uh, uh, in the work that we've done is this allowed us to also look at this idea of kind of pattern making um, and, and decorative accents in, in the um, uh, timber cells that we were trying to use. Because we just noticed that um, there was a lot of, obviously, historically, in, in the whole time I've been in practice, timbers are very kind of well-established. Um, timber rain screens have been a well-established way of um, uh, uh, of um, finishing buildings as a, as a kind of um, cladding and facing material for buildings. But it, it often seemed to, to be in a kind of very consistent um, um, way. And we thought there was an interesting, another way of doing that. It, it's always, um, I've always wondered, and it's probably because of the cost and, and the kind of workmanship that goes into that and the additional cost that that would do. But surely that uh, now with modern methods of construction, there are there are newer ways of um, doing, being more ornamental 
with um, the materials that we use right now. And people are doing that with brick all the time now. So there's lots of projecting brick work, lots of hit and miss brick work and, and pattern brick work everywhere that we see. So much so actually that in a lot of brick work that we're doing, we're actually um, making a brick, um, we're trying to <laughs> make brick quite monolithic um, quite often to kind of set ourselves apart from um, the pattern brickwork that, uh, that other people are, uh, are doing and kind of work with uh, relief. And I'll talk a bit like that, uh, talk a bit about that in, in, in later projects. But again, this is another view that, that talks about those um, kind of, um, uh, the, the, the kind of urban realm um, quality of, 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 of the project. Um, I did. I did tell Lucy that this was going to be a half an hour talk, and I, I've just noticed I've gone way over that. So I'm just. I, I, I'm. I'm almost there, Lucy. Please do bear with me. Um, uh, and but obviously these are places for people to live as well, and we're really interested in um, kind of how we work with um, internal spaces, um, and obviously that's even more important in terms of kind of private amenity and access to outdoor space in these times of, uh, of COVID. But it was frankly always a thing that people needed to do. Um, uh, and access to outdoor space when there's not a lot of green space it was always important for people. It just got even more important in terms of homeschooling and home um, uh, uh, working and people being on top of each other most of the time as we're all kind of inevitably are nowadays. Um, this is a project um, uh, that we uh, that ended up being a feasibility um, project. Um, we were initially appointed for the feasibility and then we were appointed for the full project, but unfortunately due to other council priorities, this had to be shelved as a project because it was only four units um, and there was um, uh, there just wasn't enough kind of resource to, to push this through for the, um, um, and I mean kind of um, capacity um, to argue the case with local residents because there are bigger schemes that would have brought forward more um, units that we uh, that the council needed to focus on. So they needed to kind of prioritise. Um, so we we um, we that shelf, but hopefully it will come back at some point. Um, but Philpot Street um, was an infill um, project, and this is in Whitechapel, and it is in um, in a corner um, uh, that is. Um, hemmed in by um, some trees, six trees, three of which are of decent quality, three others of not great quality. I mean, there's literally a branch up there that is hanging at the moment that has to be kind of tied back. Um, um, so the, the kind of dieback has been um, chopped off and 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 kind of pruned and um, pollarded, I believe the word is, as, as we speak. Um, and um, so in this corner, the, in this plot of land, it's about 70, 72 um, square meters is at the moment a um, nominal um, amenity. But as so often happens on, on, on these um, on local housing estates, um, because of the, the cost of maintenance, it's actually locked off. You can't get at it. You can only um, uh, kind of um, see it. So it's a visual amenity, not a, 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 a kind of a, a real amenity as a garden. Um, also, when it was open, there was in, in an immense amount of um, uh, uh, antisocial behaviour, which is often a thing that we find in local authority estates. Whenever we go, go and talk to people on infill estates, the first thing that people are, are uh, worried about isn't actually what the building looks like. The most important thing they're worried about is um, security. They want to feel safe getting from the bus stop to their front door and not feeling like they're going to be threatened in any way. And that's a kind of fundamental thing that affects all of your um, kind of experience of where you live. Um, and that's the thing that we try and those those kind of fundamentals are the first things that we that we focus on before we do anything aesthetic, before we have any other, other conversations. But the other thing that was happening on this on this plot of land was um, that it was a kind of bin store. It was a kind of open air bin store for these massive paladin bins, um, because the the kind of sh um, shorter block that you see on the side of the right hand side. Um, um, block existing gray block there is a um, an existing access um, so it's your kind of common core but it's also the shoot um, and then the the um, the caretaker kind of puts it in the in the pink bit next to it and kind of leaves it there until it's um, come and carted away on on, on 
bin day. So it's just this kind of what could have been a, a lovely amenity, but is actually just a bin store and um, a piece of lots of hard standing with some planters that are overgrown and not very well kept. So it made sense to infill that with um, some housing and make it useful, but also to use that um, use to reconfigure the refuse arrangements, to re reconfigure the security arrangements, to provide overlooking, to, um, to, to make it a kind of active frontage, to reconfigure the common core to make it more convivial. Um, and also, um, while doing that, we we try to think about how materially we could use something that's load bearing, that has some sense of kind of masonry to it, um, uh, but isn't using um, the system built um, masonry that was used, concrete system built masonry that was used um, there in the 1950s and 60s when it was a kind of when it was an appropriate material to use, or it felt like an appropriate material to use. Um, so we started to, um, because of um, the, the, so these are some of the other options that we, that we did. So we had a kind of, we had a max scheme that infilled the, the full area. And then we had some other um, schemes that um, worked more with the um, root balls of the existing trees. And we kind of scalloped back at ground level um, uh, uh, and started to look at those. And we were kind of in consultation about which of those options we, we, we would go through. But um, the MAX scheme, we could have worked, we felt, and both reprovisioned re some more trees. So have had a kind of net um, gain of trees, but also um, work with the existing trees and around the root balls of those, but not in such a kind of um, expressed way with uh, that would have happened with, with scalloped trees. Um, we also had a kind of lower rise scheme where we provide um, only um, a couple of units there. There was a kind of, uh, there wouldn't have been so tall, but we felt that was a missed opportunity. But because of it was only four units uh, uh, that we ended up with, it gave us the opportunity to work with not just kind of these decorative accents that we, we began to kind of think about, but also to work with the idea of rammed earth. Um, and, um, uh, and all of a sudden in this very unique context, rammed earth, over a couple of levels um, became strangely feasible for a social housing local authority project, um, which hasn't been done in the UK. So lots of people have talked about that around death. There's a, lots of experiments. Um, Bushy Cemetery by uh, Walter Sutton Architects was shortlisted for the Sterling Prize, uh, which, which is, uh, employed around death elements for the Sterling Prize a couple of years ago. Um, so we know it can be done um, in lots of um, technical ways. Um, and we, we're really encouraged, by the way, how the Sterling Prize starts to reward things like the Cork House and Unround uh, and uh, Bushy um, uh, Cemetery and various other kind of um, sustainable solutions that also have these kind of aesthetic um, uh, um, elements to them. So we're really encouraged and um, kind of challenged to, uh, to, uh, as architects and designers to kind of think about um, solutions in, in, in similar ways. And we, we really enjoy that um, kind of current spirit um, that's abroad. Uh, we also um, really like the idea of this kind of th these decorative columns that are about kind of from kind of hewn, hewn bits of timber and kind of these elemental, uh, working with these elemental materials. And that these kind of this pattern, this kind of floral pattern, which, which comes from um, a, a, um, a pattern that was developed by a mentee of mine uh, um, uh, while she was at the um, uh, London School of Architecture. I'm going to credit her, Shay Adewale. Adewale, I hope I've said her, her name properly. Um, she's just got married, actually. So she's she's almost certainly got a different name. Now. I can't remember what it is. Uh, so forgive me, Shay. Um, um, so we we um, considered how we would make that out of clay, handmade clay, um, clay, but probably factory made. But we'd kind of make a handmade made mold and then kind of re reproduce it, uh, and and then start to look at um, only using concrete um, and probably low carbon concrete, um, where we've reduced. Somebody somebody recently told me that we could get a, a reduction in about thirty to fifty percent in the carbon. Um, um, in, in, if we needed to use um, concrete for some elements. Um, the interesting thing about rammed earth is obviously that the walls need to be thicker, your construction, um, your build up needs to be thicker, um, uh, considerably thicker. So um, uh, unit sizes and the, the footprint of, of what you're putting there then obviously increases. But this context in this specific site um, lends itself to that. Um, you also get plenty of benefits long term in terms of um, uh, it's um, environment, uh, it's um, energy performance. So um, obviously with global warming, um, 
um, overheating is actually more of a problem for us. Um, uh, uh, a friend of mine at the moment uh, lives in a recently bu uh, built unit in the last five years that, that has amazing kind of insulation credentials but during this um past summer has been virtually unbearable to to live because it just it it's just like living in an oven um uh, and what you can get from the kind of thermal mass of the the um rammed earth of thicker rammed earth words that then give off their their heat or give off their cool um through um over a kind of uh, a longer a range um, our m and &E engineer will kill me for not remembering the I, I, something I can't remember the technical term he, he, he mentioned for um, how, how the process of how that works. But there are there are other benefits is the point I'm making of putting round earth on this. Uh, and so whilst there might be um, some initial cost um, uh, um, inputs so in the capital cost, there are other benefits in all of the stuff we're doing here. And it's also a kind of prototype and a research project. Um, but then also always part of this is as i said the, the kind of the social benefits and the social impact and the kind of uh, the way that people actually just every routinely use their environment so kind of the, the idea of a kind of convivial um, um social um uh, common areas of from the common areas that they currently have um where people can meet each other where you know your neighbors where there are you know there's um uh, rationalized storage for perhaps um, cycles where there's rationalized refuse so that it, you don't have this kind of mucky um, bin shoot solution that um, stinks the place out and on a you know hot bank holiday weekend where there haven't been a um, um, refuse um, collection uh, where there's noxious smells and, and vermin you know you, you take all of that away you just simply through these very um, frankly um, straightforward um, solutions make people's lives better, make people's everyday lives better. Um, you, uh, and, you know, that is how we make communities work better in our, in our view, by kind of talking to end users, um, asking them what their day-to-day -day problems are and dealing with those first and then buying trust and building trust and then having conversations with them about the things that we would like also like to do as designers. Because at the end of the day, we have, you know, we have lots of interest in this, but we're designers. That's what we do. That's what we trained for a very long time to do, frankly, twice. Most architects um, train for seven years. I trained part-time, so I trained as an architect for 10 years. Um, um, and that was kind of so that I could design as much as anything else. Um, this is a project that I would almost call our breakthrough project that we're working on at the moment. It's called Waterloo Gardens. It's in Bethnal Green. It's a phenomenal site. Um, it's in uh, on the edge of the Grand Union Canal. Uh, it overlooks Victoria Park. Uh, but it's also in a conservation area. So it marks the edge of a conservation area. Um, on its right is, uh, on the left, sorry, is um, the uh, uh, an estate, an interwar housing estate that was established um, uh, from the uh, 1920s almost, so it's almost uh, 100 years old, um, but it replaced 100 years ago uh, an arms house um, that um, was there and some slum housing that are, are um, still visible if you have a look on Charles Booth's um, um, slum, uh, sorry, uh, poor, poor, poor maps um, of, of London. Um, it kind of marked the edge of, of where that poverty was, uh, began to be kind of densest. Um, uh, and then more latterly, um, on the on the right, uh, sorry, let me, let me just go here. So so more latterly on that left hand side, there's a, that curve. That's a, the, the, where it's, you see that curve um, in the 80s and 90s. There's the Peabody Estate um, uh, by Peabody Housing Association. So there's uh, social housing. So there's these various social housing contexts. And then obviously you've got um, the terrace housing um, that you can see there on the right hand side, some of which is privately owned, but some of which belongs to what's called the Grand uh, Union Canal Co-op. Um, Grand Union Co-op, which is another housing association and a co-op um, of established um, uh, homes and then there's a, a a separate type of home ownership which are the canal budgets so these are home moorings that are established on what's on on the belmont wharf which is a a recently established wharf there so these four um boats actually represent three households um to uh, and one of them is a working um barge um so we had we were given this amazing brief to both provide um new um social housing to retain um, uh, children's play and a ball court um, that's there um, to 
provide to retain a community garden that was there uh, to uh, create a kind of sense of identity and um, uh, play space, but also to kind of create access and potable water, electricity, a kind of um, storage facilities um, and access to the um, home moorings, to four home moorings. Um, we worked uh, on this project. So we started this project for a year and then we master planned uh, kind of how all of this would work. It, as I said, it forms a, uh, there are massive amounts of constraints. So we, we were working with, we are working with two local planning authorities. So one of them is um, the local planning authority for the local council. And the other one is the Canal and Rivers Trust. Uh, and to, to work with these. But um, halfway through the project, uh, we um, had, it was, it was a, a really, it is and still is a kind of fraught um, stakeholder environment. And we, we understand that because over a really, really long period of time for many years, um, this site, um, it, this project is replacing an existing community centre, which is dilapidated and decrepit and has issues like asbestos and um, terrible thermal performances occupied by a nursery called Scallywag. So the, we initially called the project Scallywags, which we, we really love the idea of whimsically. Um, uh, but um, lots of lots of members in the local community are really fond of it. Uh, other um, members of the local community, including the Tenson Residents Association and the homeowners of the uh, uh, of the boats there, but other um, organisations were open to to to, to co-locate in other activities on the site that would re would resolve other problems with the um, uh, in, in the borough because the council has a uh, 19,000 um, um, housing waiting list uh, and 50% of those are on pressing housing needs. So they had to look at ways of also, they also had the duty of looking at ways to provide new home ownership and sorry, new um, uh, housing for people on that waiting list. And this is, um, at, we, we, we thought we could provide um, 14 new units on this of 100% social housing. Uh, and we wanted to do that. And, and because of the kind of demands of, uh, and the constraints of this, um, halfway along the project, the council brought in um, some uh, another architect to focus on the community centre, which is this kind of um, triangular shaped thing in, in the foreground here, uh, which um, in, in pictures I'll show you in a moment, it's got a kind of curved uh, edge to it. So that's by our, our colleagues, Make Space Architects, who were working with you and me architects uh, on that. Uh, and then we master plan the, the the rest of the uh, the site, and we um, provided um, the um, housing uh, developments there, which are the two units that are on the side of the um, canal. Um, slightly lost my track there, so I just I'll move on there. Um, yeah, so this is from inside the estate, looking out um, uh, at the estate. So this wasn't our initial design, is the, is the first thing I'm going to say, but we're, we're, we're quite, quite pleased with where we, we got to from there. Um, because it was, uh, in fact, I'm going to go into the, the next image and I might come back to this. Um, because it's the, um, it forms the edge of, the site forms the edge of uh, uh, a conservation area, the um, uh, local authority planning officers were really, really keen that we matched the, the brick um, stock to something approaching the existing brick stock on the um, uh, uh, historic terrace. Um, so, so we went for this really light brick, which is actually the same brick um, that is being used, that was used by um, friends and colleagues of ours at um, uh, Henley Hale Brown and Karakuswich Carson uh, and others at um, King's Crescent in Hackney um, just down the road. Mm -hmm. So we, we demonstrated there was a brick stock that had been used in, in this part of East London um, relatively recently and that won awards and um, that was pleasing. And so we, we, we kind of got them to use that. Uh, but the, the idea of these kind of these um, tall points, we call them, I mean, they're, they're obviously chimneys. Um, uh, of a sort, but they're not kind of chimneys in the way that um, people have thought of them. But we we, we thought of um, mm. these, we conceive these as kind of tall points, but they also have these kind of illusions, um, uh, 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 these kind of whimsical, whimsical illusions to chimneys that you see in this area, and they, they, they kind of call, recall back to, a, to an earlier age. But actually, the, the thing that made us um, come to these points and think of them as tall points was that the site initially in the, 18th, in the 19th and 18th century, actually, used to be the site of a sawmill. 
Um, so this used to form the edge when um, Victoria Park was kind of rolling, virtually rolling countryside. This used to form the edge of the city to some extent. Uh, and uh, the, the canal was obviously a working conduit that, that brought in kind of timber that was then processed in the sawmill. And it had this, these really tall chimneys that, that um, were uh, part of a working mill. So we wanted to have, kind of make allusions to that. And we wanted to kind of have these tall points. And what they're actually doing, two of them are working and one of them, the one in the middle is sacrificial. The two that are working are actually ventilating passively the bin stores because of that issue that I was talking to you about. That um, Often bin stores are at ground floor. They're right next to people's homes. And in, um, you know, on hot summer days, if there hasn't been a collection, you don't want to be the family that has to live next to those, believe me. You don't even want to be walking past them because the smells are awful and, you know, they're, they're very communal and if they're shared by too many people, um, as many of you know that are listening, that, that kind of the more ownership, the, the, the less ownership that people take of things because more people are using them, the, the less anybody takes care of things. So um, we felt we could kind of build in a way of kind of exhausting those passively um, at a really high level. Uh, and they would be doing a job uh, through kind of just convection and they would be doing a job that um, used to happen um, with chimneys because of people had hearths and fireplaces. Um, uh, but one of the aspects of those we really liked as well, sorry, I keep flicking through those really quickly. One of the aspects of those we really liked as well was that it allowed us to have these kind of inset stone panels um, that could create a sense of identity. So it's just, uh, there's something about the landmark aspect that I was talking about in the Brick Lane housing. These these things that are visual kind of markers and that, that um, create an identity. We wanted this new development to also, if I go back, to, even though this is a new development, we wanted to be, it to be part of this existing location and part of the existing um, estate. Let's move on from that quickly because I still want to kind of um, labour this and maybe we can come back to it if there are any questions. Um, another project we, we're working on at the moment is Edward Man Close. Now this is cited um, on the, um, just off the, via, the viaduct that goes from the bank to Canary Wharf. Um, and there are two, again, um, uh, I think that's that's a time of telling me that uh, I, I'm just uh, I've, I haven't got too long to to to, uh, to move on, but I'll just I, I'll say this really quickly. Um, so this is on the viaduct between Bank and Canary Wharf for the DLR, um, and uh, it's in Limehouse. Um, and it's again, it, the council wanted an infill um, project um, that would create new housing um, that would um, bookend. The, uh, an existing site where are these two, where there are these two um, existing units that face each other and kind of create this courtyard area. Again, they've got these very prominent um, shoots. Um, there are again issues about public realm. There are again issues about refuse, antisocial behaviour, um, security, safety, um, parking, all the kind of day-to-day -day things that nag at people in children's play space. So we're still working on this. Again, it's a, it's a, this is a RIBA stage two at the moment. Just behind it, through those openings that you can see there, um, is a Troxy um, uh, um, uh, kind of music venue that's the other side of the DLR. So that kind of locates it quite uh, quite clearly. So we wanted this both to create this housing there. We need to do that, but we wanted to kind of create this sense of permeability and this other thing. Uh, and we want uh, uh, um, and we. Um, I think we wanted to kind of work with something that I haven't always been a fan of, which is deck access, because that was the only way we could really get access to this, the only way because of the constraints that this could work. Um, but also these kind of open, far more open common areas so that how you get access to your flat um, feels safer and isn't kind of concealed and that people can see you from the public realm and you can see them and you can feel safer as you go up and go to your front door. But um, that also that these would have more space. So this obviously has more issues again about um, space standards and net to gross and, and all these kind of technical issues that architects talk about all the time. But um, how can we, and, you know, I promise you this was before COVID, but how can we start to talk about kind of these more generous spaces that make the spaces work better because if you don't what you end up with is, is in a very few years time uh, and there's a project there's a james sterling project uh, um in runcorn called uh, southgate estate in runcorn that was um it, so he was designed by james sterling at the top of his game in 1977 beautiful drawings the, the, the you, if you look at the architecture or press at the time the photographs of it were uh, sumptuous when it was built but it was knocked down within 13 years of being built 
because it actually didn't deal with the way that people lived. It looked great, and all of us architects love it, but it didn't deal with the way, it didn't address the way that people actually lived. Um, so it was uh, blighted very, very, very quickly. So um, I, I won't labor that point, maybe you come back to it during the discussion. Um, but then we again these are some of the kind of decorative aspects that we talked about so like uh, that, that kind of pink material we, we were thinking about um kind of um uh richard norman shaw's albert hall man mansions as a kind of precedent for this and looking at the kind of decorative access we started to kind of then kind of go to town and uh, uh, with, with these decor decorative accents. I mean, the risk we're, we're, uh, we're, which we, we may easily be approaching now in, in our practice, and we have to be really careful of, is kind of being decorative but not being twee, because um, that's that's really easy and uh, re easy to do and not being parochial. Um, but we wanted to kind of play with these kind of. This is another kind of um, interpretation of those columns that we we looked at in the Philpot Street project, and these kind of we looked at these decorative. Um, um, dwarf columns here that sit on these kind of pedestals that are um, kind of reliefs of um, brickwork um, uh, that that actually look monolithic. So a kind of monolithic brickwork and a monolithic, um, possibly monolithic. We're still looking at that at the moment. Re uh, mortar. Uh, uh, in the brickwork, but then making the kind of variation there and the articulation through a kind of relief of, of, of panels and layers. And then um, working with um, kind of a faience um, terracotta of these lighter, paler, paler elements. And we're still kind of working with those color um, kind of, kind of balance, balances. And at the kind of street level, you may see uh, another interpretation. Again, we're still working through these, of those kind of petal shaped motifs um, that we're working on on other projects as well. Um, but these are just social housing. These, these um, at the moment are providing 20 new units of 100% social housing. Um, and that's why kind of it, 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 these have to be there. And often we're having these conversations uh, with people uh, and they're quite fraught. Like, as I was saying at Waterloo Gardens, just because you have a diverse team doesn't mean that your conversations are less fraught with local residents. But what it means is that the element of trust, there's there's an, there's a there's an additional element of trust and buy-in that we can at least establish conversations with people perhaps quicker. So we don't claim a monopoly of virtue, but we do feel that there are unique there is a unique kind of way and role we can have as an interlocutor to have conversations with people. Um, and, and to be part of teams, and that's frankly why you should have more diverse teams. I mean, it just it just goes without saying. Um, uh, as far as we're concerned, it seems obvious, but it doesn't necessarily seem to be uh, the other way. Just between our, our unit and the and the DLR, by the way, is a, a mechanics yard, which is a kind of established mechanics yard. So that's an additional constraint. Um, there's a massive main sewer that goes below um, the site, just between our our what we're showing and the existing block um, that's there, that's in that kind of biscuity colour. Uh, I'm just going to move on and just just end on um, something about our supply chain because we think this is really important and actually what it talks about is um, our narrative, our own mental narrative, because it's part of our process. Um, we um, go out of our way almost to self-consciously try and make sure, and this doesn't mean we exclude. We are, we want everybody that uh, represents all of London's backgrounds to contribute to our our. our, our designs to contribute to our practice. But we make an effort at the moment to go and look for people who find it really hard to break into architecture, but are architects. All of these people that you see here, apart from Tessa, who um, is in the um, bottom left-hand corner, who's our practice manager, um, all these people uh, here, so Rim and uh, Joseph and Asare and 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 uh, uh, Leah, who is, uh, who's been with us for a year now, are all trained, architectural practitioners. Uh, Joseph is a very experienced architect who's um, currently uh, the holder of a Churchill um, Fellowship um, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, and he's actually doing research in West Africa as, uh, as we speak. Um, all of these people are uh, trained um, architects, uh, but you don't often see them reflected in um, uh, teams. And um, what we we often try and do is bring these people and bring our supply chains along in projects that we work. So this is the team that we put together for a Thessaly Road underpass competition. So it's ourselves. Um, we could have done that competition by ourselves, but we wanted to expand our team to um, include Westport and Company, uh, Right Talk Listen, who are uh, um, engagement specialists, and um, uh, Mary Evans, who sat next to me on, on the right-hand side next to me there uh, as part of our team, to make sure that we expanded opportunity and kind of join dots and make sure that people um, know that there are people out there because we are often told 
unbelievably that people don't exist and we can't really understand why that is. But thank you for that. Thank you for being patient with my um, um, slight, well, going considerably over time. I hope it wasn't too boring and I hope I can draw out some more um, aspects in conversation. Thank you. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, David, for a really engrossing and thought provoking talk. It's full of packed full of valuable insights about how you, you, you're you engaging um, with um, lived experience uh, in London, your particular uh, idiosyncratic creative approach. So I've got two questions which are related before we um, move to audience questions. I can see one is already standing by. Um, so my first question is about cultural heterogeneity in architecture and placemaking and the other one about culture, the culture of architectural procurement. So the first one, um, heter heterogeneity in, in, in what you you say emblematic architectural styles and, and means, ways of doing things that you espouse, which enables the interpretation of very, very many different cult cultural and ethnic influences and shared in individual bespoke ways by very many of your generation and their predecessors. And that's a number of those I've studied in my books uh, personally on young UK architecture is about making space for and with end users, creating access for them, being fully responsive to others, their lived experience, as you say, their inspirations, their cultural languages, personal iconographies and messages. So supporting a better sense of urban belonging in your words. And uh, this is very, very um, timely. Open House this weekend has a slavery in the city walk and there are more tours in October for Black History Month, a symposium with the Stephen Lawrence Trust, a body that Temple Bar Trust collaborates with uh, on educational initiatives on expanding the definition of heritage, underlining this urge to reassess the way in which uh, the city has been shaped. How do you want this much needed unity of aesthetics and ethics, the sharing of identity and meaning, practitioners and end users in placemaking to develop in London as it struggles to overcome the pandemic crisis? Um, thank you for that, um, that question. Uh, I, I, think, um, I think London needs to, and I, I think how I want it to develop is, I, I want it to be routine. And one of the reasons I think it's really important to be returned, that's not out of selfishness. I mean, as I say, I'm a designer. Um, all, all, all architects are designers and, you know, we will do, we will be creative. We will always be creative. But it offers us another kind of opportunity, another language and a, a, a le uh, sorry, lexicon and a vocabulary to kind of delve into because it's part of all of our heritage. And I have these conversations often with Historic England uh, in, in that everybody, as I said earlier, has a relationship to heritage. Uh, but we also have a, we have a relationship to our own personal heritage. We also have a relationship to the people around us and the place where we live and these, these uh, environments. And this has always happened, hasn't it? I mean, it's always, you know, we, mm. we go to you know to, to, to kind of uh, things that have influenced um all of us come from different places everybody goes abroad you know like and, and sees things and they bring them back you know the, the, you know georgian architecture and palladianism and and, and and so on and so forth this, this isn't new this is mm. this is common and people abroad i think this is this is the real answer to your question people abroad are fascinated by london they're enthralled to london so it creates a currency for all of us um, beyond uh, particularly, you know, with things like Brexit, or, which I personally kind of regret, but um, it's happening. Um, but like, it creates a currency for us in the world outside of ourselves that creates opportunity for all of us as well. So it's, it's got a kind of value for us economically and a currency for us as a kind of nation if we can reflect these things and interpret them and find a new kind of meaning for them. So um, it's not just the kind of thing that we should do because it's good and it is good, but it's a thing that we can do because it's also sensible in my opinion yeah absolutely absolutely i hear you i hear you so fantastic um my second question is about empowering architecture its practitioners and communities and the authenticity of the variety of ways in which people live through promoting the diversity of inclusivity of the profession and reinventing procurement and all of that is a really big discussion at the moment uh, it has to be said that it was well over two years ago that the Architects Journal did an extensive research report on this very topic with the Stephen Lawrence Trust, the race diversity survey asking, is architecture in denial? Um, and in the wake of the, the Black Lives 
matter movement activities and uh, events. Um, and uh, UK diversity champions calling for quotas. So, for example, Yasmin Sheriff, director of Dennis Sharp Architects this very week at the AJ 100 Festival. Um, public sector clients like um, Peter George, director of Meridian Water for Enfield Council, requiring housing architects from GLA's ADUP2 framework to team up with 50% BAME and women-led practices to support aspiring architects in the community with their education. So there's also been this further wave of diagnosis of disempowerment and how to solve it. So at what stages in their careers do women and BAME practitioners start losing out on opportunities? So for example, architect uh, Sumita Singha, who campaigned to be Reaper president, advocacy for new curricula at secondary and uh, further education level, reassessing British history, while others say diversity um, is a 10 to 15 year project of everyone putting their house in order to help transform the profession. Uh, guess who that is? That's Simon Olford, the president-elect of Reba. Um, I would personally question how long we have to wait for that, uh, that, that assessment of the duration. So what measures do you believe are needed to change the situation at speed? Um, I, there are a few of them, but I just like comment on those points if I can yeah. first and, and mention some of those people. So um, mm. I was told architecture is a 10 to 15 year project uh, 20 years ago. So as I said, I was I mean, frankly, uh, that, that, that's, yeah. that's what I that's all I was saying. And so progress is inevitable. And I almost talk about it like the revolution of a wheel. So um, when I was studying, um, it, it always seems like it's getting better. It's getting better. It's getting better. It gets to the top of the wheel and we have to start again. And architecture has no memory. And I'll give you a little anecdote that explains that. So mm. in 2000 and um, uh no, not in 2000, I'm sorry. So in uh, 2000, yeah, it was, 2003, the, uh, there was a report written by the RIBA with the um, Welsh School of Architecture. I think it was something like, why are women leaving architecture? Why aren't women, why? And then in 2008, five years later, there was another report, follow-up report saying, five years later, why are women leaving architecture? In 2018, 10 years later, after that, after the um, uh, Me Too um, uh, movement um, came to prominence. Uh, there was a series of articles from the RIBA um, saying, we really must do something about this. Why didn't anybody tell us there was a problem? Yeah, it, you know, something to those extents. So architecture, institutions, I would say, not architecture, institutions have no memory. And we are kind of outsource this and it's often somebody else's job to do. And people like Yasmin and people like um, Elsie Wusu and people mm -hmm. like Audley English and Wilfred Ashall and uh, Terry Okoro and uh, Leslie Loco and, and uh, Chris Nasser and various others whose name I've even forgotten. Mm. have been doing this for literally decades and are still around and you know like you you need to understand that if 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 you've heard of if there's a black architect that you have heard of by name they're a unicorn because of what they've had to do to be where they are so that you've heard their name has got to be exceptional because that you know, and it's it's not because there aren't enough people trained it's that enough people don't get through the system so for instance there um and the short the short answer to your longer question is there are various different dynamics one is education yep. One is wide participation, which is Stephen Lawrence Trust does par excellence. One mm -hmm. is education, one is in practice, and then the other one is how you encourage independent practitioners. Each of those are interrelated, but they all have a distinct, different dynamic. And the the point, I've slightly lost my track, so I'll, I'll come back to it. But one of the things you just need to do is make sure that each of those are focused on, but there are things that people can do now. And I think Enfield is showing some leadership on that. And and Elsie once told me uh, about no, Elsie and Audley English pointed out that in the early Blair years, in the same way that there was a kind of attempt to do kind of a short start, but then that fell away, there was mm -hmm. an attempt to do this and there were some opportunities and then there was a box that was ticked and everybody moved on. So what was missing, I'm afraid, if we're talking about 15 years time, isn't the initiatives, it's the follow through. Mm -hmm. It's the vigor mm -hmm. and it's the follow through and see if, uh, add attention to it. And it's actually somebody focusing on it and making it a strategic issue. Mm -hmm. And I think loads of um, clients don't make a, st a strategic issue um, and others do and the ones that do cr create the benefit from that and and they serve their uh, and I'm particularly um, conscious of this where it's in the public realm because we all pay for for this out of our public taxes mm. I pay council taxes all of my family pay tax council taxes statistically um, people from ethnic minorities actually in, in London at least have a higher than the London average of educational outcomes in, in specific groups but statistically they have higher 
than the um, London average of unemployment, which actually indicates that even if people have higher qualifications, they find it hard to find jobs. In famously diverse East London, I know an architectural pra practitioner, and I won't embarrass her now because she's doing quite well, she's quite well um, uh, uh, known and regarded. Mm. She had to go and do her year out in, in famously diverse um, Slovenia because she couldn't get a job in London on her year out. So that is, this is how uh, the world works. So quite often, I, I think the simplest answer to what you're saying is we can't outsource it to other people. I meet really intelligent architects all the time. The most intelligent people I know, far more intelligent than me are architects. That, you know, all they need to do is focus their attention, listen and focus their attention on solving a problem that is no harder than all the other problems that they solve all the time, frankly. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, I think um, I, I think we need to all hold hands uh, institutionally and individually to make sure the impetus and the main the momentum is maintained and, and driven up. Moreover, in fact, it, there's no uh, excuse for slacking off or you, we cannot, as you say, if these cycles cannot just dissipate yet again. So, um, OK, so now anyone who has a great first now for asking a question please do put your question in the chat i can see what we have from paul weston is um his question which is he's saying i love the attention to the micro david within a capital city that has got ever more macro in scale and boy does the nla's new changing face of london report show that if anyone has watched, uh, anyone has seen the exhibition or um, read the report. So how are the changes in the population and the dynamics of London, he's asking, influenced your work over uh, over the last few years? Um, I think that's a really good question. So um, certainly in terms of it's influenced that in, in terms of inclusivity. So this is a really interesting thing that's uh, about the diver diversity discussion. I do keep coming back to this because all of our design actually is, a, is, is all about our process and it's all about our identity at the same time, so simultaneously. Um, we went on the journey because I realised that when I started talking about, about diversity, I was really talking about myself. So I was talking about a black male of a certain age and a, a certain generation. And actually, it allowed me to start understanding that there, I, I walk into a room and I feel more confident talking than say a woman of a certain age or a woman at all, or, or somebody from another background. And I live and grew up in Southwark. And when I was a kid, for instance, most of the people in my school were Irish. And then when my kids, uh, not sorry, not my kids, when my um, uh, siblings, uh, probably my younger siblings went to school, most of the kids uh, in their school were African. And then uh, there's another generation uh, where most of the kids in that school were then South American in this part of, of London. And then more recently, there might be Eastern European. So it's allowed me to recognize that this is a di kind of dynamic thing. And, and everybody who knows anything about Lon the history of London and particularly where you, uh, 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 a Temple Bar Trust will be able to tell you about the, the continuous kind of waves of people that come through London and influence it. And that is just mm -hmm. part of the, the DNA of London. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it's, it's probably, to the answer to Paul's question, is it's probably a consciousness that that continues, that that is a fluid process, that there are always new people coming in, and that's exactly how it should be. And it's a really kind of diverse thing. I was reading some kind of, um, you know, uh, some books recently about kind of Wessex and pre-England. And, you know, the Danes came and there, you know, there is a kind of Danish and the Frisian and the Angles and the Jews. This is a, if it needs saying again, um, mm. this has always been a diverse island. That's mm. how it's always been. It's not a new thing and it's not a mm. kind of strange thing. Mm. Yeah, my own my own surname is comes from Huguenot Normandy French. So there okay. you go. Um, right. Um, so let's have a look. Any more questions? Um, speak now or forever hold your yes <laughs> i think i just warn everybody out but uh, I, well, I appreciate i appreciate david i think that you have given you have given more than you have given over and above absolutely a wonderful stimulating inspiring multi-layered talk um in getting it showing really explaining in detail how you engage with all the issues 
um, to do with what is quite a unique intersection across architectural design, placemaking, construction manage management, housing and community engagement, reinventing community engagement as well. So to go back to the subtitle of your talk, you know, expressions of diaspora heritage are really defining drivers of a mindset that allows everyone to contribute to their built environment. That That's exactly how it uh, should be because we can benefit so much for, from it. That's the argument, um, including through uh, the stories, the oral histories, the perceptive observations about lived experience. And I think your refreshing approach to placemaking and architecture today um, is applicable hugely in other contexts beyond London. And I'm sure that you will be very soon going on to work in many, many other places. And uh, you have already, but uh, so. this is going to happen. <laughs> So this whole approach strongly enriches architectural culture and it's deeply sports diversity, social, inc uh, social cohesion, inclusion, and live the cause of livable and equitable urban futures. So thank you so much. Thank you, um, thank you very much to you, our, our lovely audience. Please stay safe. And we look forward very much to seeing you again at future talks. Um, very excited that we have on the 1st of October, uh, architects Paul Williams, co-principal of Stanton Williams, and Julian Harrop, principal of Julian Harrop Architects, talking about their major project for the Museum of London's new home at West Smith Smithfield, uh, the last ruin in London, to use their words. Um, so places are still available to reserve, but please act now. Go to the Temple Bar website, templebartrust.org, and act now as they are going fast. So thanks again, everybody. I thank you, David, uh, and see you all again very soon. Thank you.